No, no, there, there is, uh, we, we are on time. And uh, uh, so last but not least, uh, uh, I am honored that uh, Sharon Hu from um, University of Notre Dame uh, has accepted uh, my invitation to uh, give a talk. And due to time difference uh, to US, uh, we could find a, a slot uh, for her. Again, uh, as for Ingrid, I cannot read all, all the CV of, of uh, uh, Sharon because then it takes a lot of time, but I can just say that uh, her story is also very interesting, uh, going from Tianjin University in China to uh, New York, uh, Polytechnic Institute of uh, New York, and then to Purdue University for uh, conducting a PhD. Um, and then Sharon is extremely active in system design, uh, VLSI, um, energy consum uh, energy efficient, uh, uh, power efficient uh, uh, system design, and also embedded systems. She has uh, a number of uh, awards. Uh, she has also she's also extremely active in the community. She was the general chair of of, of DAC, and uh, I am happy that uh, she is she found time and is going to give uh, a talk. Sharon, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Ahmed, for the nice introduction. I think you can see my screen OK? Can you? I assume you can see my screen OK? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> OK, great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you never know, right? <laughs> Even though we have been doing this for more than a year, it still not always worked perfectly. So. Uh, okay, well, I'm so glad to uh, be invited to attend this event. It's really a special event and it's really close to my heart. And I really wish I could be there person, uh, physically, but um, given all the current situation, the travel just uh, a little too hard. So I'm glad to meet everyone virtually. And uh, you know, also want to say good morning, good afternoon, uh, or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, so what I uh, like to do today is, uh, you know, just like um, Ahmed has directed me, I'll briefly introduce myself and then I'll talk some exciting research I have been doing recently. So when Ahmed asked me to do, uh, to introduce myself a little bit, I actually reflect a little bit. So I, I think I will, if I were to start, I would say, first thing is I had never thought I wanted to be a professor or teacher. And that, you know, uh, Ahmed mentioned that I was originally from mainland China. And that uh, when I was taking uh, the college route, we have to fill the form. And the form has to say what, what schools you want to go to and what major you want to be in. And I told my parents, last thing I do is want to go to a, a, a normal, uh, I think we call it un normal universities, the type of universities that trains teachers. I said, no, I don't want to be a teacher. Uh, so I started out with, uh, let me see, let me make sure my, oops, you know what, my, my PowerPoint just crashed on me. I'm sorry. So gave me a, while I'm put saving up, get my PowerPoint back up, I will just say it in words about a few things. Uh, let's see. And so I started out, uh, go, when I go to college, I, I, when I fill the form, one thing I always say is I'm not going to be a uh, teacher. And so I went to Tianjin University, a uh, engineering college, a uh, very famous uh, engineering college in, uh, in, the, uh, in China. And uh, let me just move these things around. Let's try this again. Okay, and I'm also going to make sure I got my laser pointer up. So uh, when I started, I actually measured in semiconductor physics, uh, semiconductor devices, and then I moved on. I came to US to start my master's, which is also so, uh, related to semiconductor, it was called solid state physics. So I'm very much of electrical engineering uh, person. Then I went into my PhD. For my PhD, I actually get more interested in circuit design, architecture design. So I went in and 
uh, did uh, my research more in VLSI circuit design. Then at that time, I'm still not sure exactly what I want to do. So I decided to go to a industry. I went to General Motors Research Lab. And there I worked on engine control modules, you know, the electronics that used to control the engines and, and uh, transmissions, actually we call them powertrains. And there I actually did work mostly on real-time embedded systems. So you, you start to see that how my career has been not always focusing on exactly the same thing. Then I, after a couple of years there, I think I find, I feel like maybe I should, I want to do more research. So I went back to uh, be, actually went back to be a professor. And I said, I just want to give a try to see whether I would like it or not. And at that time, my research, again, mostly focusing on real-time embedded systems. And after a couple of years, I find, you know what, this is actually what I really like to be able to do teaching and to be able to do research. And that's what excited me for most. So I decided to stay and I did move to a different university and move also start to explore all sorts of different types of research. I think this is the wonderful part of being a professor is you get to explore different types of research. So I, I continue to do my uh, real-time embedded system area research. Then I move on to do more on the low power, low energy uh, related circuit and system designs. So we'll also look at a lot on temperature reliability. And most recently, I actually moved into more of designing circuits and architectures based on emerging technologies. And sometimes people say, hey, why do you, you know, why can't, how can you move to from top to bottom and bottom to top? And that's because of all the education I have got, right? So I, I kind of use this graph to show how these things are all related to each other. So my end story is now I say, you know, teaching is actually definitely me. So the, the story, I think what I like to say is, it's okay if you're not sure about your career goal yet. You know, if you are still in college, uh, I don't know where you at in your in your career, but anyway, I think it's it's fine to be to be a explorer to find out where your heart really is and what you really attracts you, and uh, it's okay to move on to different things because lots of things you learned will always help you eventually. So that's uh, kind of uh, my little life journey. Uh, what then? What I will do today is I will just focus. Uh, my talk on this last part of my most recent work. This is more on designing circuit and architectures based on emerging technologies. So why do this? And I think this is probably not new to some of you if you're having pay attention about computing. Right now, we are just basically diluted by data, right? We have so much data every day and it just keep growing. And this is a graph I, I got from the internet and basically it says, that we will hit 175 uh, zettabytes of data to process by 2025. Now, what is worse actually is lots of these data, the, those part of data that growing really fast is what we call the unstructured data. And those are really hard to process. Now, to see why data processing is important and why, it, especially how it's related to energy consumption, I actually got this graph from uh, the Semiconductor Research Corporation's uh, recent publication from 2021. This is, they did a, a study called Decadal Plan, looking at 10 years from now, what, you know, what are the needs? So from this plan, one thing you can see that energy consumption by electronics or, or by, for data processing, actually it takes big chunk of our overall energy con consumption in the world. And, and uh, what, is, what is really disturbing is these energy needs it doubles about every three years. Right? However, if you look at this, this is the world um, energy production. It's basically increases linearly. So what does that mean? That means sooner or later, and people will predict that in about uh, you know, 2030 ish, we're going to be limited by the, you know, the computing capability going to be limited by the energy uh, output from the world. Right? So that's actually a very serious problem. Uh, people also predicted, you know, by uh, 2030, 20% of world electricity will be consumed by, by you know, computing. So now the, then the big question is, what is really causing all this energy consumption when you do data processing? 
Uh, if you haven't seen this, I, I can just tell you in a, in a very high level few words is actually data movement. When we're moving data from memory to compute unit, that actually costs a lot more energy, sometimes can be 100,000 times more energy than doing computation itself. Say you do multiplication, you do addition. Okay? So data movement is a big chunk of energy, sort, uh, energy uh, consumer. Now, data movements not only makes energy looks bad, make latency look bad, it also causes security and privacy problems. Now, if you think about all the upcoming, you know, all the new, new um, applications, for example, like machine learning, bioinformatics, or secure and privacy, they all increases the data. In a sense, they all are very much of, we call it data intensive applications. So they, again, the problem will keep getting larger, bigger and bigger. Now there are works on the bottom, uh, I would say on the bottom layer where people working on devices. So we have, we started out with uh, CMOS devices. There are lots of new devices, I call them and emerging devices or emerging technologies. And these devices are all more memory focused. So they do help on um, tackling some of the memory problems, but the memory movement is still a big uh, problem. Right? Now to, overcome this type of what we call a memory war challenge, in-memory computing is attracting lots of attention. So in now instead of moving the uh, data from memory to CPU for processing, in-memory computing, what we want to do is we do the computation inside the memory. Now by inside, it could be right in the memory array or at the peripheral of the memory array. Now, uh, depending on how you design it, they can do different type of uh, uh, operations here. So with many of the emerging technologies or especially emerging memory devices, they actually opens a, a open doors for designing really compact and interesting in-memory computing units. And that's what I like to focus on today. So here I show a few examples of in-memory computing cores. And you see that one is a DRAM based logic engine, and that's basically doing bit by bit logic operation. I could use SRAMs to build an ALU, in-memory ALU in the serial operating operation mode. And people always also use RAM with a resistive RAM to build a matrix multiplication engine. Okay? And this is also called crossbars. And we also have, uh, this is uh, magnetic material or STT based MRAM logic unit inside the memory. And uh, here is another example is we call it FerroFET. This is another new emerging technology. And that's where using, uh, or people using it to build what is called associative memories. And so given all these technologies, the circuits, you know, different functions they do, one challenge is how do you design in-memory computing components and how to exploit them so that you can really get the best at the application level, because eventually we want to accelerate or we want to make more energy efficient applications. So given that I actually pulled this, uh, made this graph trying to show you that I, this work is actually really interesting. It spans from the bottom, in the bottom up fashion, you can think of starting from the choices of uh, memory devices and then the circuits, architectures, to algorithms and all the way to applications. And it's also important to think about it in the top down manner. So if you are an application level researcher, you also actually have a great influence on how we're going to design on the lower level because the application, the algorithms will help us to shape you know, how the different thing, how the different components should be designed, should be chosen. So in my rest of talk, I will focus on one particular type of in-memory computing engine or one particular type of, um, one particular type of applications. And I call them associative memory supporting efficient search. So you probably say, why search? And actually search is a very important class of computing compu computation kernels. And you can see that it appears in lots of uh, applications. I show some of them, I saw a bunch of them here. These are actually very easy to think of why they need search. And there are also some of them are immediate, you might not immediately think they involve searching search operation, but actually they do also. So uh, I hope maybe some of you can find something you're familiar in this uh, lots of examples here. Now by associative memory, 
Uh, it's also called content addressable memory. And what it is, is it basically can support really efficient and parallel uh, search operations. So the simplest CAM is actually a binary CAM. So if you the look at the bottom part, we call this, this is the memory. Suppose by binary it only stores zeros and ones. And query, or the data you want to search, is also contains zeros and ones, okay? And when you do the search, it's basically parallelly compare the query with all the data stored in the memory, and then it outputs whichever row or whichever word that is a match. Uh, another popular one is a ternary cam. So in this case, you see that besides one and zero, I can also store don't care, which is the X. So both query and memory can have uh, don't care bits. And now again, we do the parallel search and we can find uh, matches. And these type of searches are actually, if you, if you design using CBOS to design these uh, uh, content addressable memories or associated memories, they can be pretty costly. And non-volatile memory devices or these emerging memory devices actually can be exploited, exploited to design really compact cams. So now let, I will show some examples of how we can use uh, a particular non-volatile memory devices to construct these uh, associated memory circuits. And the device I would like to use an example is called Ferrofax. It's a relatively new device, but it has been attracting lots of attention from the device side people. And Ferrofax is made by incorporating a ferroelectric layer in the gate stack of a CMOS transistor. So if you look at it, it's very much like a CMOS transistor, except the gate stack has been modified by using a ferroelectric material. And by doing this, actually now the behavior of the device exhibits a, what we call a hysteretic behavior. So you basically have this kind of a loop, uh, a hysteretic, hysteretic loop. And what this tells you is it can be used as a memory to store information. Uh, Global Foundries, this is a chip that uh, a photograph, uh, the chip of, uh, that produced by Global Foundries. So uh, actually this is in Germany. Uh, they, they showed that producing a large chip of ferrofax devices, and they can use it to store uh, information. Uh, other companies like Intel, Samsung, TSMC, they are all actively working on these devices. And uh, in the US, we have a large uh, DARPA supported project that's worth looking at these type of devices and how to use them in circuits and architectures for, for accelerating applications. Uh, just a few words, if you are not familiar with Ferrofax, here is how a Ferrofax works. It's actually very simple, okay? So what we do is we first program it, meaning we call it, we apply a program or reset voltage to program it. Then we use different erase voltages to program the device to have different, we call the threshold values. So when you have different threshold values, then they can give you different behaviors. If I program it into, to, into having two threshold values. Then if you read the vote, if you put a small voltage, we call it reading, then you get the current and you can see that distinctively you have two set of current curves. If you set in the low threshold voltage, then at the low read voltage, you have a large current. But if you set it to a high threshold voltage, then at low voltage reading, you don't have a current. And if you have a high voltage reading, then you will have a current. So that's basically how the device works. And if I use different type of programming uh, voltages, I can actually get multiple levels of threshold voltages. So this becomes really important or really useful to store multiple bits of data. So that's about the device side. And then also there's some good things about the devices. It has a high ion off ratio, meaning that I can put in more states a memory state, and it also has a three terminal, which also make it easier or simpler to design circuits for it. So let me come back to this, you know, content addressable memory, or uh, actually, let me use the TCAM as an example. And first example I want to show is we call a TCAM exact match. By exact match, I'm talking about all the cells in the row, they have to match to make that particular row to be a match. Anyone, any rows that has even one single cell that's not matching, then we call it is not match. So to build this using the uh, ferrofats is actually just need, need two transistors. And to see how this works is also quite simple. 
So basically, first I program it into, suppose I want to program it into a high or one. Then I basically put one of the transistor into high threshold, another transistor into low threshold. Now, if my search, uh, if I want to do search, I first pull up or pre-charge the match line. Then I suppose I put in my search data or query data is one. Then I put one on this high threshold side, I put zero on the other side. And you can see that because the threshold voltage is set this way, actually there's no current going to flow through this, okay? And the match line will stay high. So that shows me this cell is a match. Now, if I put a zero on the, as a query, then you can see that on the, on the left-hand side, right? There's a higher reading voltage than the threshold voltage. So I have a current of, or discharge current flowing through then my match line becomes zero. So that's how I show the, indi or I indicate there's not a match or mismatch for this cell. And now if you put a string of them and connect them in the or fashion, then I achieve the, uh, the TCAM uh, function. Okay. So the design is extremely compact. And, but then what it needs is you can see that it does need a pre-charge stage. So there are other type of designs. Uh, for example, I show one design here is one ferrofax with one CMOS transistor with some complicated uh, reading on the match line. So that way then we can, we can get rid of the, the pre-charge that's needed. Now one, people have also used different technologies to design content addressable memories. I show a few examples here. And actually there's some interesting work that's showing the comparisons of these. And the bottom line is ferrofax is very competitive. So I showed you an example of T, uh, TCAM design. We can also use this TCAM actually to measure degree of match, not just match or not match, but how much it matches, right? And in this case, uh, for example, I'm showing here, it, suppose these are the data stored in the memory. And if I gave you a query, then one thing we will notice that for the row or for the word that has more mismatch cells, they're going to discharge faster than the ones that have fewer mismatch cells, right? So if I can sample the match line at a particular time, at the right time, then you can see that the ones that has fewer matches, they should have higher match line voltages. And the one with more mismatches, they will have lower match line voltages. So if I can sense the differences, then I can actually measure the distance. So in this case, you know, one distance three and one distance one. And this, this type of distance is actually called Hamming distance. And this type of functionality is actually very useful for applications that are needing, say, some of Hamming distance based nearest neighbor search. So now what I have showed you exact, I have showed you exact match, show, it, show you that it can be used to measure the distance metric. And developing on that, we can actually design a circuit to do best match in a sense, I will find the, uh, Role that has the most match. You see in this case, not necessarily every single cell is a match, but even when they have a small number of mismatches, as long as the role that has the least number of mismatches, it's going to be outputted as a, as a match. So that's based on that uh, distance metric measurement I showed you before. Then for, I can also use it to do what we call the threshold match. That's also a very useful, uh, app, uh, very useful operation for some machine learning examples. In this case, I'm setting a threshold to two. So any row that has uh, mismatches less or equal to two will be labeled as match. So now we have two uh, matched rows, right? And it turned out that same ferrofat cell design that I have shown you before, it can be used to implement all these different type of uh, TCAM matching functions. And what did make them different is actually the, just the sensing circuit. Uh, I will skip the details on the sensing circuit design. Now, uh, recall that I have showed this graph before. I said, you know, you can set the ferrofats to have two different threshold voltages, or you can set it to have multiple threshold voltages. And uh, I have to tell you this little important fact is if you want the ferrofats to have more states, typically it's going to be a larger device. 
Now this larger is all relative, right? And you can see that the device size I showed you here, it's all pretty big. And the device people are working actively to shrink down uh, these um, device size. But still, if I can have multiple states, can we use it to design even more interesting cam or content addressable memory behaviors? And the answer is yes. So here I'm showing another design that we have recently published. It's a work called a, a multi-bit cam. And so in this case, you can see that the, the memory cells now, each of them will store four states. So these little square represent the state. And depending on the setup of threshold voltages, I can store four different states. In this case, we call this a two-bit MCAM. Now then the query will also can take on one of the four states. So if I give this type of query, then now the match, the matching is actually follow the same principle as I discussed before. Basically, I just monitoring the discharge current or monitoring the match line voltage to see which one has more match cells than others. Then I can do the distance metric. I can also do the exact type match type of thing, right? And so this design, actually, I can just use the same two ferrofat design I had before. So it's really a very powerful structure that can do lots of different things. Now, the way I told you, it seemed to be very simple, but they, to make this work, there are lots of issues to be studied, right? How do you design the sensing circuit? And how do you make sure the device-to-device -to -device variations works? Uh, so there's lots of really interesting research in this area. And yeah, I think I have mentioned that by this design, this is really, they can support exact match, best match, and threshold match, like I said before, except that now where you, we have a more compact design, right? In terms of number of transistors. Um, so if I were to put all of them together, I, you know, I talk mainly focus on the ferrofat, but all these other emerging devices, if you are in this, you, if you know them, you know what they mean. If you not, don't, don't worry about it, but I'm just saying there's actually lots of choices on the device level. And what I have showed you, there's also lots of choices in the circuit level, right? We have binary or T cams. We also have multi-bit cams. And then we also have different type of matching functions. And one thing I don't have time to go into details a lot is different cams can actually measure different type of distances. I talked about um, ternary or binary cams measures hamming distance. The multi-bit cam actually is not necessarily measuring the hamming distance, it's measuring a different type of distance. And that distance is what we call the sigmoid-like distance. And that's actually very useful. Uh, but given the time, I won't go into that detail. So basically there's uh, lots of interesting circuit level designs. And another type of design in our recent work we have done is called analog cam. So this is actually treating both the stored data and the query data in a lot analog fashion. And in this case, instead of doing the type of searches I told you before, it actually can do a range search. Basically, we look at the query is within a range or not. And that's also a very useful uh, uh, operation. Now, all these different CAMs can support lots of different type of applications. And I just pull out some examples here. You know, for example, it can support attention networks in uh, few shot learning, and also for graph processing. And they show some others like a string matching and um, vector processing, hyperdimensional computing, decision trees, uh, et cetera. So there's just lots of useful uh, functions can support. Now to maximize this application level benefit, what we need is really a cross-layer exploration. I, I just show you this little you know, kind of circle, just how, how these devices, circuits, architecture, algorithm, applications all feed on each other. And in order to do that design space exploration, we also need some good tools. And my group actually recently have uh, worked out a tool called EvaCam, and we will publish it soon on GitHub. And actually the paper just ex got accepted a date. Um, anyway, so that will also help us to do the design space exploration. So, so far I've been mainly talking about the CAM, uh, just CAM and search operation. And actually CAMs can also be combined with other type of memory functions. So this is kind of expanding the in-memory computing uh, functionalities, okay? And what I show here 
is a design that combines content addressable memory with just random access memory. Right? And the, without going into details, I will just tell you that for this design, again, I can use CMOS or can also use a Ferrofax, but the design is a little more complicated. Instead of two Ferrofax, now I need four, tra four, four, tra four transistors, right? I need two Ferrofax and two CMOS in order to make this um, kind of reconfigurable functionality to work. Okay? And uh, again, you know, these type of functions, uh, these type of functions can support uh, okay, different type of applications, which I will show a little bit later. And there are also other works that they build uh, computation at the peri memory peripherals. And given the time, I will not go into details on that. So I'd like to use the rest of the time, just discuss a, a two examples to see how we use the circuits, the architecture that I introduced before in some interesting applications. The first application I want to talk about is called, uh, called few shot learning uh, based on memory augmented neural networks. Now we all know that humans are really good at learning from a few samples. So if I give you these four type of dogs, and now if I give you another dog, you probably can easily tell me which dog, which type of dog this, dog, this query dog belong to. But for neural networks to do this, you need more, you, regular neural networks would not be able to do this. And it doesn't have the capability to learn new classes on the fly, right? And, but there are interesting works from machine learning community uh, that trying to tackle this type of problem. They call it few shot learning. And one of the uh, network that has been designed is called memory augmented neural networks. Okay. And this memory augmented neural network basically consists of a neural network itself and a, what we call the embedding memory or memory module or attention memory module. So there's all sorts of different names, uh, but key is it contains a memory to store some interesting information. And what it does is it takes a support image, or you can say the few shot training samples and use the neural network to extract the features. And these features, we're going to call them uh, embeddings. And these embeddings then will be stored in the mem in the this memory module. Then when when we get the query, we also use the uh, neural network to extract features uh, for this query data. Then what we do is we use that uh, the embedding or that extracted feature compares with all the features that stored inside this memory module, and the nearest one or the closest one to this query will be considered to be the class. Okay? So, the, so again, you see the key is introducing this embedding memory module. Okay? And how to realize this embedding memory module, you can see that it's storage, and this also needs to be able to support nearest neighbor search. And to, in traditionally, this basically just implemented on CPU and GPUs, mainly it's on GPUs, and then the embedding memory is basically external memory, right? Uh, kind of the the uh, the DRAMs or the graphics memories, okay? And that actually can be pretty costly. And we have done profiling to show that how much time or energy spends on just doing uh, this memory movement. So now we uh, the idea is, can we use those memory modules that I discussed before to implement memory augmented neural network? And the answer is yes. And so one way to do it, this is a work that we published a couple of years ago, and this is using a TCAM as the embedding memory. Now, in order to uh, increase the accuracy, we actually not just directly using TCAM's Hamming distance based memory, just store the features. We actually use a locality sensitive hashing to hash these features into a function into a, a type of function, into a type of representation that can produce better accuracy. Then we store those, uh, those uh, LSH uh, extracted embeddings into the, into the TCAM and then use the nearest neighbor search to get the best match and to get the, uh, the, you know, the, uh, uh, the few shot learning you know, to be able to do the inference. Now, another one, is actually a using the multi-bit, the multi-bit, the MCAM to directly implement the embedding memory. Now, in this case, we no longer need 
the LSH or the locality sensitive hashing anymore. We just simply directly make use of the nearest neighbor search operation, the type of distances that the AMCAM supports. We can also get a embedding memory and, and see that how, how well it works. So what I'd like to show you, you know, without going into the details of implementation, let me just show you how good it, how good they are in terms of accuracy. Now, I I mentioned I mentioned it briefly, very briefly. I talk about you know there's device to device device variations. So device variations actually have an impact on the accurate application level accuracy. So when we study the accuracy, we actually want mm -hmm. to see how these device applications implement device variation imp um, impacts the accuracy. So here I'm showing you I'm plotting accuracy uh, versus uh, the standard deviation of variation. Okay. And I, I showed six different curves. And the top, the top one is the GPU using floating point, and which uses also cosine similarity. And then I have the curve, you have the other curves there. Uh, these, these two are the MCAM implementations. And this top two and the bottom one are the different TCAM implementations. These top two TCAMs are very large. And the top one is like 8,000 some cells for T, 8,000 cells per row, and that's impractical, okay? But then just by looking at this, one thing you'll notice that if my variations are relatively small, actually my AMCAMs and my Two large, minutes. okay, my AMCAM and lar uh, large, um, sorry, my AMCAMs and large TCAMs uh, has, you can see that has a pretty uh, acceptable uh, accuracy drop, right? This, this didn't drop that much. You can see, I'm actually just plotting from 70 to 80. So you see a big gap, but actually the drop is very quite small. It's less than 2%. Okay. However, when the variation gets bigger, you can see that it does drop significantly. <clears throat> and now one interesting thing I also mentioned briefly is if you want to have multiple uh, levels, you really need a bigger device, right? And larger device also helps on lowering the um, variations. So then the larger device, however, takes more energy. So then the question becomes, you know, what is, what is a good trade-off between energy, delay, and accuracy? And here's just a really simple drawing that we have done. We, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but I'm just pointing out that uh, here, depending on whether you use MCAM or TCAM, you actually can get four times difference in terms of energy consumption. So MCAM seems to be more um, giving us more energy benefit at, at about ISO accuracy. Uh, now, since Ahmed invited me, I know uh, there's probably people here, lots of you are, are doing security. So I just want to talk about another quick uh, application of security application. So you probably all know more about security than me, but I just want to say that one security, one popular security uh, operation, of course, is uh, data encryption. And you know, data, you all know what data encryption is. And one thing, of course, you probably all also know that there's large amount of data and that data is just keep growing. The data needs to be encrypted, keep growing. And there are also like IOTs, you know, edge computing that really would like to have fast and energy efficient data transfer for encryption, right? And so now one, lots of the uh, encryption algorithms, we found out that they are memory intensive and they tend to have lots of them are bitwise logic operations. So they're simple operations and they probably also can benefit a lot from lookup tables. So that triggers us to say, can we design in-memory computing accelerators for, uh, encryp for encryption engines? And here is a design that we have been working on and we call it Encrypto. And this Encrypto at a very high level it basically functions as a coprocessor, encrypto coprocessor, and also as a cache for secure data. So it supports encryption and decryption in a single design. And it uh, basically encrypts data to be sent to the main memory and decrypt the data uh, for CPU processing. Okay. And encrypto actually supports many different kinds of uh, 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 encryption algorithm. It could be different type of AES operations and also some block ciphers and as well as some hash, uh, hash functions. Uh, uh, in, inside the, uh, the uh, I'm just using AES as an example. So you can see that AES basically have four type of, four main type of operations, right? Add round key, uh, sub bytes, mixed columns and shift rows. 
then inside the in crypto, we have a risk processor that help us to increase the programmability. And we basically extended the risk uh, instruction set. And then it has three more components. The first is compute enabled memory. This is just basically for implementing uh, add round key. The second is a lookup table for implementing sub bytes and inverse sub bytes. And then we have a shift unit to implement the shift rows. To maximize the utilization of the lookup tables, we actually combine the sub bytes and mixed column to the same uh, to the same function, and then let it be executed on the lookup table unit. We design a, uh, a hybrid random access memory and counter addressable memory design to, to support the encryption and decryption. So this actually goes back to the design I mentioned before. So, but this is the, remember that I mentioned that uh, random access memory, uh, memory and content addressable memory together as one unit. And that's what, exactly what we're using here for that lookup table. And for the uh, other part, for less, for, for example, this uh, compute enabled, this is basically using memory and then with computation on the peripheral. And that's the part that I didn't get to discuss. So um, now if I compare this in crypto with a bunch of other designs that I recently published, and we'll see that this red area, that's what uh, the uh, uh, in crypto covers. I, I'm looking at all sorts of different uh, metrics here. So you can see the larger area covered by a particular design, that should be the better one. So in that sense, it's uh, it, this Ferrofax based, this, or actually this is CMOS based. So I'm just showing the CMOS based in crypto. So we actually have two different versions, in crypto uh, CMOS based and the, uh, and the uh, uh, Ferrofax based. So you can see that CMOS is very good. And if I look at the Ferrofax, it basically gives another about 4X improvement. Um, now let me move on. Just want to quickly mention there are also lots of other in-memory computing designs. For example, you know I showed two uh, machine learning related like hyperdimensional computing, transformer networks. Uh, we also had a work recently on using in-memory computing for homomorphic encryption, and we can also use it for DNA map read mapping and type of operations. So let me just quickly wrap up. You have show you an example of using associated memory for some in interesting applications and going from more or less bottom up. And I also mentioned that you could also do this uh, from a top down fashion. So I, I think from my talk, I, uh, the takeaway is there's lots of opportunities in terms of reducing data transfer overhead, you know, offering higher throughput and data, you know, data retention, et cetera. And there are also lots of challenges, right? Challenges such as how do you balance the density and functionality? How do you reduce peripheral overhead and pro providing programming support, et cetera. So I think modeling and tools are also plays an indispensable role. So there are definitely a lots of interesting and important research problem uh, to solve in this big area. So with that, let me just acknowledge all my co colleagues who have uh, my students, my colleagues who have helped contribute to some of the work I presented here and I can take on some questions. Okay, thank you very much. So any questions? No, I thought you raised your hand. <laughs> any question on chat? Let me see. Unfortunately, I cannot, okay, I click on it. Uh, uh hello can you hear me yes yes uh, it's uh mihai moldovan from romania uh i have a question if you may answer uh how long do you think uh, it's gonna take for these uh, revolutionary devices or uh, memory to make it to market basically uh, i'm thinking uh, to actual laptops and uh, cloud uh, farms uh yeah. yeah i i would say probably uh, i i don't want to give a precise number you know this is i think there's lots of research going on very active research so the industry people are active working on it you already see the prototypes from these um from the companies i think i would say probably you know, I would say probably five years out if you want to really see it on your on your laptop, on your phone. And the reason is, 
research needs lots of uh, works on the lower levels and on the upper levels. And the key is really we want to show the benefits. We want, really want to show there's not only you know, the energy benefit, the latency benefit, the economics benefit, and then they will get into the production. So think, for example, like um, you know, if you know um, like uh, magnetic base, like STTs or M STT MRAMs, that has been there you know, for a long time and now just start gradually going into some of the uh, real products. So I, I think it will still take a while for Ferrofest to get there. Hi, Sharon, this is Ingrid. Hi, hi, hi Ingrid. Uh, question. Um, so in these new devices, uh, can you easily tape out? Do you have like design kits or how do you do? Um, so we we have uh, tape outs we, by working with the industry people. So actually Global Foundry is one of the partners we are we are right now as we are as we're speaking, we're actually work, uh, working on a design that to ask to work with them to get uh, to get a tape out. So it's a uh, uh, well, yes, to get that tape out, then it will be a design kit. And I think currently they are working at 28 nanometer technology node. And that's the that's the one that we're- And, and for which ones? I mean, you have mentioned so many of these new uh, memory types. Which ones you can tape out or they tape so, out? Yeah, so the one we're right now we're working on, we hope to put a content addressable memory more the the two level, two level, the ternary content addressable memory and some crossbar. Actually, I didn't discuss much about the crossbar. We can also use Ferrofest to build crossbars. So that's what we, we would like to tape out. It's basically build a large memory array that implements both the content addressable memory and some crossbar functions. Then, then we can combine them together to implement something like what I told you today, like that few shot learning, because some of the uh, matrix multiplication need the crossbars and search needs content addressable memories. Okay, thank you. Okay, is there any other question? I don't see anything here in the chat. I don't see anyone asking a question. It's kind of uh, late for you guys, right? <laughs> no, actually, it's not really late here, yeah. but we had a long day, so. Yeah, I know. Uh, but uh, in, in, in general, usually, you know, even in hybrid uh, uh, sessions, there are not so many questions. Um, okay, so I, I think uh, with that, uh, we want to thank Sharon again for, for her time and uh, being here. <laughs> thank you. My honor, my pleasure to be able but to Sharon, join you. Guys. Prom you promised that you come next time. That's right. Uh, I will. Yes, we will be happy uh, to have you here. You can show you. Also, the surrounding is very nice here. As we have some also nice uh, places. Um, yeah. Looking as good as the place, uh, the picture behind you, yeah? Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> I should have mentioned, right? That's uh, that's actually the springtime of Notre Dame, yeah. where I'm working, and I actually took the picture myself. Wow, okay. <laughs> so, okay, so uh, with uh, this, uh, we come to the closing uh, remarks. Uh, uh, I just can... Um, really uh, deeply uh, thank uh, our speakers, uh, those who were uh, virtual and those who were physical, which is actually very nice. We still had some people here, some victims sitting here and listening to all the talks and ask uh, uh, questions. We have some interested uh, students, hopefully PhD students who are hungry and want to eat for free. Um, for those who participated, attended virtually, uh, I also want to thank them because it was a long day and I hope that we see each other next year. We are going to organize it anyway and hopefully we have it uh, as in the first time where, where, where around really 200 people were uh, together in this uh, lecture hall. So thanks a lot and uh, see you next year. Thanks, Aaron. And bye. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. You all have Talk a great Talk to you evening. later. Talk to you later. Yeah. Bye. Enjoy. Thank you. Bye bye.